Good morning, I'm Zach Staten. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Omneya Bushnab. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about over the next hour. Office of Health Promotion is promoting sexual health on campus through its frisky February events. iSchool students are in competition to figure out how Syracuse can improve its snow removal. And today's the best or worst day, depending on your status. It's Valentine's Day. SU music students are adding a little jingle to make everyone's V-Day lovely. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story this hour, we take a look at how SU is promoting health and sexuality education during the month of February. Our Liliana Pearson joined us live in studio with the story. Thanks, Zach and Omnea. Dubbed Frisky February, the Office of Health Promotions is sponsoring a series of events designed to celebrate and inform students about sex and sexuality. I checked out one of these events to learn more. This past week, the Syracuse University Student Association set up a sexual health fair in the Shine Student Center. It's a really fun event, and it's a chance for us to bring conversations about sexual health and sex positivity to the students right here in Shine. The Student Association brought awareness to Shine by setting up booths about sexual health from on and off campus providers. Students can visit the booths, learn, and ask questions and receive prizes. Borges is hoping to change the stigma around sex and sexuality. So we want to make sure that students feel comfortable um, with sexuality and with who they are and their at varying levels of sexuality. So we want to make sure that they know it's like okay college. Students have been responding positively to Frisky February. The wide lineup of events caters to a multitude of students so you can learn more about yourself and those around you. Sarah DeMarco is a graduate student at Syracuse University. She said providing these events does more than educate. It also allows people to share as well. I think by having it, you know, you're opening the doors for people to come in and learn and also giving people platforms to speak and talk about issues that are important to them. DeMarco said having people who are comfortable talking about sexual health and awareness is an important part of becoming a more informed person. We all have pondering questions, so I think like if you see that they're there and that people are open about talking about it, I think that's what draws people in because they know that there are people they can go to that aren't shy to talk about it and will answer their questions. There are still many events left to attend, such as drag shows, discussions, and pizza parties. You can find the full list on Syracuse's Office of Health Promotion website. Reporting live, I'm Liliana Pearson for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks a lot, Lily. We're going to take a break now to go check on our weather. I mean, we're getting a break from all the snow because the temperatures are starting to rise. Epiphany Catling is live out on University Ave to tell us what to expect. Good morning. Love is the only thing in the air today. If you remember last week, we were expecting a snowstorm that had five to eight inches of snow. But on this Valentine's Day, there is snow on the ground, but it, there is not any falling from the sky today. But there are intermittent clouds, which means the clouds will appear and disappear throughout the day, allowing the sun to shine down on us. It is currently 37 degrees with 73% humidity. There will be gusts of wind at 14 miles per hour, and tonight there will be a low temperatures with partly cloudy skies. There will also be rain showers going into Thursday morning, so make sure you have your umbrella. Thursday, the rain will continue for most of the morning. We can expect the rain to stop around 10 a.m. After this, the skies will be cloudy with light winds until around 4 p.m. The rain showers will pick back up and it is expected to rain on and off for the rest of the day. Friday, there will be cloudy skies, rain, and snow flurries. This will be the coldest day of the week, so take extra time to warm up your cars. Going into the weekend, we are not expecting snow. Saturday will be partly sunny day with light winds, and Sunday we will be able to see more of the sun. The skies will not be cloudy, but there will be gusts of wind. So for the rest of the week, you could expect to see some, a few changes in the weather. That is your Mornings on the Hill update. I'm Epiphany Catling. Back to you in the studio. Thanks a lot, Epiphany. The planning for Itanwa Orinwa, or Black Graduation, has now begun. Seniors are gathering together to plan this ceremony that honors all who identify as students of color. Graduates walking in May can now sign up through the official Google link. This tradition was started at Syracuse University back in 2004 and is meant to show appreciation to campus minorities. Vice President of the Student African American Society and Planning Committee member Fanta Sharif says Itanwa Orinwa is meant to celebrate diversity and serve as a more personal ceremony. Well, they wanted to have 
the ceremony to just highlight black talent, um, all the things that we contribute on this campus and just to celebrate it, just to have one event. And a lot of times we just feel like we're just a number instead of like um, a contributing member to the class. So black graduation really tries to highlight that. Updates will be posted on the official Itanwa Orinwa Instagram page as well as in the senior group chat. Itanwa Orinwa will be held on May 11th at 8.30 p.m. in Goldstein Auditorium and is open to both undergraduate and graduate students. Many students may not be aware of the Underground Railroad history here in the Syracuse area. But it is a perfect time to learn with this being Black History Month. The Onondaga Historical Association is right downtown. One exhibit at the OHA is Freedom Bound. It's the Underground Railroad coming. in Syracuse. No, the coolest part of the exhibit is the carved earthen faces that were found in a local church basement. They may have been carved by escaping slaves hiding in the church. One local history teacher was visiting the Freedom Bound exhibit recently. He says we have history all around us. Sometimes we just need to open our eyes. And an exhibit like this or a place like this allows us to um, get in touch with our neighbors and their ancestors and how this space was used historically. You can visit the OHA Wednesday through Sunday. The museum is free, but they do accept donations. SU has announced the launching of the Office of the Ombuds. The office is designed to give faculty, staff, and graduate students another channel to voice work-related complaints or questions with the promise of confidentiality. A permanent Ombuds person is expected to be named, but until then, Professor Emeritus Samuel Clements has been named head of the office on an interim basis. A search committee has been formed and includes Clements, university professors, and administrators. The office is located in Suite 215 of the Health Services Building. And today marks the sixth day of the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Junior broadcast journalism major David Edelstein is in Stamford, Connecticut right now interning for the Games. Edelstein says his time at Citrus TV here on campus has prepared him well to work at NBC Sports. Though he's working a difficult overnight shift editing videos and logging the live events, he says he's grateful to have this unique opportunity. I know that I am very fortunate to have received this internship because of a lot of hard work that I've done but I've also been put in the positions to have the opportunities and to do that kind of hard work and be able to focus on doing that kind of hard work rather than maybe doing other things in that time uh, because of the position that I've been put in from other people who've worked hard in my, in my life before me. We have an Alberta Clipper Storm coming Edelstein from Canada. Edelstein will return to Syracuse after the closing ceremonies on February 25th. No surprise here, Syracuse is the snowiest large city in the nation and keeping the streets clean in the winter continues to be a huge challenge. Our reporter Sarah Bonadiz is live with us in the studio to tell us more about how the city is turning to the community for answers. Thank you, Omnea and Zach. Temperatures might be heating up today, but so is the competition for what can be done with the large amount of snowplow data that was released by the city of Syracuse just last week. I spoke with the city's chief data officer, Sam Edelstein, on why the city is teaming up with SU's iSchool and AT&T for a competition to plow through the data. The streets may be clear now, but in the snowiest city in the nation, that's often not the case for Syracuse. What is the case? People want to know what's being done about the snow in their neighborhood. Um, I care about what's happening on my block, and so making it really easy for people to be able to see what's happening on their block um, I think would be really useful and is certainly a way for us to be able to transmit information to people without them needing to call and say, hey, when's the last time that a snowplow was on my block? The snowplow data released by the city last week can show just that but making it usable is a challenge. It's hard to work through because it's just tens of thousands of rows of data in a spreadsheet. Um, and so we're hoping that people can make sense of it. Each of the city's 37 snow plows has a GPS tracker located inside, which is how the city was able to collect the data. But now that it's been released, it's up to the public to determine how it can be used. The Civic Hackathon is a competition that challenges designers, developers, and community members to find some way to make the data usable. Um, our hope is just that people come up with creative ideas. So someone could come up with an app that could show whether a snowplow has plowed their street or not. And that would be useful to us. It would be useful to people in the community. But you don't need to know how to build an app to participate. You can take this in whatever way you want. And um, I'm sure it'll be helpful for us in, in some way, shape, or form. The contest to help the city plow through the data is running until March 1st. 
Cash prizes are available for first, second, and third prize. If you'd like to participate, head on over to the iSchool's website. Reporting live in the studio, I'm Sarah Bonanis for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, virtual reality news is becoming a reality. Now an SU PhD candidate is giving students the chance to test out VR technology and earn a few bucks. Also coming up, no need to refrain from working out due to the cold weather. This indoor club will give you the exercise you need. Stay with us for those stories and much more here on Mornings on the Hill. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. The Department of Public Safety works to keep students safe, but it also urges students to keep track of their own personal belongings while on campus. Laptops, cell phones, textbooks, the list of valuable things we carry around every day is almost endless. And between rushing to class and making sure our homework is done, it is easy to forget something in the library or a classroom. The U.S. Department of Education reports the number of reported robberies have gone down on campuses. But there are things you can do to keep your items safe. Go right to the DPS office, which is on uh, College Place, right by our bus stop. And usually, DPS offices will be walking around. They they tend to integrate well into the community. So you just you try to go up to one and you tell them what you've seen, and they'll do their best to accommodate you. There's also a DPS office right here in Bird Library. If you see anything suspicious, you can call the Department of Safety at 315-443-2224. A study called the Comparison of Virtual Reality News with Television and Internet News is taking place on campus this week. For the next week and a half, you can visit Newhouse 3 to take a look at a media experience of viewing television and web news in augmented reality. A study conducted by PhD student Song Yoon Rai aims to see how people perceive news in various formats. You know, the real news is coming, but we don't know uh, whether it is um, good for our perception, credibility, or emotional response, yeah. Sung Yoon Rai believes that virtual reality news is the future for the industry as technologies advance. Participating in the study gets you $10. As the temperatures continue to stay low, exercise may be, putting, uh, may be put on your back burner. But stopping your exercise program could have damaging effects on the progress already made. At SU, one club is continuing their routines by making the simple transition inside. The Syracuse Running Club is now meeting inside the Manly Fieldhouse. The club will keep their workouts there until early April. Club Vice President Brad Eckersley says he's seen a decline in the amount of people who come to sessions during the winter, but hope that the move back inside will help bring them out to run with them. Um, we're just kind of telling them that we do have an indoor facility, so if they're kind of tired of running outside in the cold or running on treadmill, that you're welcome to come here, use the indoor track, and kind of joy like a time with friends and stuff like that. Syracuse Running Club meets four times a week. The club competes in meets and local races, but also welcomes in non-competitive runners. Well, today is Valentine's Day and love is in the air. So how is social media changing the way we date? Our reporter Sarah Perks is live in studio this morning with Newhouse professor Makana Chalk to talk about that. Sarah? Thank you and welcome Professor Chalk. So you have done so much research on social media, relationships, and the way that people perceive each other. So let me first start off by asking you why you think social media has had such a big impact on our current generation and the way that we do date. A lot of it has to do with the way in which we now communicate. It, it has an impact on how we meet, uh, on how people communicate once they have met, and of how they break up, which is also a bit different. Um, one of the things we're seeing is more online dating. Although, actually, it's only about a third of uh, young adults uh, meet someone through online dating. But they do tend to meet people, and more, pe more people are meeting through social media. Um, what used to be these interpersonal networks where you met friends of friends in person, you now tend to meet friends of friends online or on whatever your social media platform is. Do you think this form of online dating helps or worsens the formation of relationships? Yes, no, and it's complicated. Um, on the one hand, it's interesting in that people tend to meet. Uh, they do a lot of flirting online. They may not actually meet in person. Um, about a third of people who have used online dating sites never actually date someone they've met online. Yes, young adults do tend to flirt, and it's a little safer. It's kind of an you know, interesting way in which you can communicate with each other. Um, but in the end, they don't necessarily meet or interact which can create some interesting issues. 
Um, there's also some problems in terms of breakups and that some people haven't quite figured out the rules for that yet. For example, don't ever break up via text. <laughs> Not a good idea. Mm -hmm. What's the most interesting thing that you've come across when doing your research? Well, we've been studying, doing a number of studies. One of the most recent ones looked at texting behaviors and what happens after a first date, how long you're going to wait in which to text someone. And we studied heterosexual adults, um, both young and old, and we found the younger you were, the more likely you were to text people. But also there were some gender differences. Um, as you might expect, the men are expected to text first and sooner and quicker. Nice. Uh, both men and women expect this. Uh, but we also found that it was kind of interesting in terms of differences um, between the reason people would give for not texting themselves were that they were too busy, they intended to text later, they had other things to do. Uh, whereas if you don't text, the other person is much more likely to assume that it's rejection, wow. that you're not un uninterested. Um, thank you so much again for joining us today. More to come on Mornings on the Hill. Some may get a dozen roses on Valentine's Day, and some may get a dozen fraternity men. When you ask the boys of five, stay with you us. With that the best story and more just ahead. Friends and loved ones is this Valentine's Day. Their answer isn't easy. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill, and a happy Valentine's Day. As the Syracuse University campus gears up for today's festivities, there are those planning romantic nights out or just a fun night with their friends. Our own Caitlin Pearson got to spend time with a group here on campus that is hoping to spend their Valentine's Day on a different note. Caitlin? Hi guys, while many people associate February 14th with a box of chocolates or a bouquet of roses, there's a group of guys here at Krause College who are planning to spend Valentine's Day bringing joy to those with the best thing they know how music. When you ask the boys of Phi Mu Alpha what the best gift to give your friends and loved ones is this Valentine's Day, their answer is an easy one. A serenade. A serenade to a serenade to a girl is one of my favorites. Phi Mu Alpha is the world's oldest and largest secret national fraternal society of music in the world. The original founding of the fraternity was a lot because of competition in music schools and stuff like that and we as a fraternity more stand for supporting each other in music as opposed to competing with each other. And it's really just about lifting each other up and making sure that we can all be the best musicians that we are you know, possible to be. The serenades have been a tradition for the group every Valentine's Day for many years now and serve as a fundraiser for other events they do throughout the year. The reactions they receive, he says, can be priceless. It's a really different reaction from people when they get chocolates or flowers as opposed to getting a song from a group of men dressed up. Um, usually it's, it's a combination of embarrassment, uh, happiness, and a bunch of other feelings that just really doesn't compare in any other way. The serenades could be purchased for in-person deliveries, and for those who wanted to show the love to those out of town, you could purchase a phone call. As the boys trudge through the snow delivering the Grahams door to door, they are reminded that this is about much more than a fundraiser, but about brotherhood. Musicians have a bond that I think a lot of other people don't really understand and you know musicians can attest to that. I was really looking for a, a home within the music school at Krauss so when I found out about Phi Mu Alpha there wasn't really a way I could turn it down. In the end the power of music is what they want to share with everyone. So we're really trying to spread the joy of music to as many people as we possibly can. One thing is for certain there is nothing better this Valentine's Day than the genuine smiles from just singing a simple tune. I had so much fun spending time with this group of guys. They are just so funny. And one thing that's really interesting is while they are all involved with music in some form or another, they aren't all singers. So I know I was very pleasantly surprised with how amazing they sounded. And I'm sure those receiving their serenades today will as well. If you want to learn more about PMA, you can find them all over social media. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Caitlin Pearson. Back to you. Thanks so much. Locally owned coffee roaster Cafe Kubal continues to expand. SU students know about the location on University Avenue, but now there's another one. This one's in the Marriott Hotel downtown, also known as downtown as Hotel Syracuse. Also at the historic hotel are the other local businesses like Stoop Bakery, Modern Malt, and Bagelicious. So it's kind of become this little cooperative effort amongst numerous other local businesses. So it's uh, I kind of like to call it a little taste of Syracuse on our on our front desk. This is Kubal's sixth location in the Syracuse area. The Hotel Syracuse location is open daily from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
as we bring in our 1030 anchors, Christine Morton and Maya Owens. Have you guys, do you guys enjoy Cafe Kubal? I do. I'm a big, um, I like the morning blend. I'm more of a morning person, so I like to have my coffee, and Cafe Kubal is a great place to start. See, I really struggle between going to Cafe Kubal or Starbucks. Uh, I'm really a big coffee person, but I always struggle with trying to choose which one to go to. And see, like, I can't drink coffee right now because I'm an iced coffee fan. I'm not a hot coffee fan, so that's just kind of counterproductive at this point. See, but I feel like that's crazy because I see iced coffee everywhere, and I'm like, it's cold outside. Why do people <laughs> drink iced coffee? <laughs> it, it, it's, it is weird, but that will do it for us this morning. I'm Zach Staten. Orange Nation, thanks for watching. And I'm Amanea Bushnab. Don't go away. Mornings on the Hill continues right after this break. Christine Morton and Mai Owens and the rest of the team will be there with much more. Good morning, I'm Christine Morton. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Mai Owens. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our second half hour. SU grad student takes her class project to the community. It's all about empowering young black girls. Artists are helping artists. We'll take you to a special exhibit space on campus. And there's a new resource for SU DACA students. We have a live interview to explain. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story this half hour, observing Black History Month here on the SU campus. One recent event focused on black girls in education. Our Alana Selden joins us live to tell us about the event, which started out as a class presentation. That's right, Christine and Mai, an SU graduate student who is studying for her master's in education coordinated the event called Reclaiming Our Education, Black Girls Lit for Literacy. I went to the event on Saturday to learn how black girls are being empowered to read and achieve. Stop letting people tell you who you are. Know who you are for yourself. It's what Tanea Thomas Edwards often tells her African American students at the local elementary school where she's getting teaching experience as she pursues her degree. She was like, well miss, I'm just bad. She says it was that response, which a young girl said when asked to describe herself, that motivated her to launch Black Girls Lit for Literacy. That made me think like, where are they seeing representations of themselves and is it that they only take in what other people say to them? Her goal for the event was to create a cross-generational space for black black women and girls to not only read together, but honor their education. Literacy goes such a far way. During slavery, it was illegal for slaves in general to have an education. So for us to reclaim that is a very powerful thing. Black Girls Lit for Literacy empowered community members to understand the needs for black girls in the classroom and to seek ways to advance their educational practices. And one of those ways was to provide educational books like this with African American protagonists who represent who these students truly are. When we see ourselves in these books, that's encouraging and it's empowering and it also tells us that we can be creators and we are just as important. But lessons to be learned were not only in the books. An older black woman could show a young black girl like when she tell when a teacher tells you you got too much attitude, this is what you do, baby. The open dialogue also allowed participants to discuss stereotypes and challenges black girls face in and out of the classroom. It's how we could be angry and or aggressive. But the older generation's wisdom was put into perspective for the young girls. Sometimes little kids or younger girls don't think older women have experienced some of the things they're experiencing now. It's just a different time, but it's the same experience. The experiences that reinforce what it means to be a black girl who loves to learn and read. They're very smart, very resilient, and they're great. That, that girls are great. And of course, Black History Month's events are continuing here at SU. Check out the cal calendar of events on the Office of Multicultural Affairs website at multicultural.syr.edu. Reporting live in the studio, I'm Alana Selden for Mornings on the Hill. Time for another check on your weather for today. This week, we are getting away from snowstorms. Epiphany Catling is live on University Avenue to show us what to expect. Epiphany, how's it looking? 
Good morning. As you can see, it is not snowing, but we are expecting some snow on Friday. This Valentine's Day, we have intermittent clouds, which means that the clouds are moving around in the sky, allowing the sunshine to come through. It is 37 degrees out here, but later on today, there will be a high of 46 degrees. Tonight, there will be gust of winds at 14 miles per hour, so make sure to bundle up. Later on tonight, there will be rain showers going into Thursday morning, and the rain is expected to stop late Thursday, like later on Thursday morning, and pick back up around dinner time. As I mentioned earlier, we could be seeing snow flurries on Friday. When it is not snowing, you could expect to see rain and cloudy skies. Make sure to give yourself extra time to heat up your cars and make your commute. Things will start to get a little brighter over the weekend. Saturday will be partly sunny with some light wind, and Sunday will be a sunny day. There will be minimal clouds in the sky and gusts of wind. One thing to remember for the rest of the week is that just because the sun is shining does not mean it's warm temperatures. Remember to bubble, bundle up because it is flu season. This is your Mornings on the Hill weather update. I'm Epiphany Catling. Back to you in the studio. My, have you ever looked outside and thought, wow, I do not want to walk to class in this weather? I know exactly what you're talking about. Then I go back to bed and I just miss class that day. <laughs> Well, for some students, it's becoming a little easier to get to class. Shaw Hall is bringing the classroom to the dorm room. Students have access to team rooms, which include whiteboards and a television for work to be displayed. Professor presentations, workshops, engineering, and computer science themed programming are all happening in Shaw Hall, giving some students that extra push to get to class. Well, I think it's definitely easier access for the students, so like, when the weather the classes right in their own dorm it's so much easier for them to have access to or just to get to the classes themselves and I think when it's so close by it almost motivates the students to go more because they don't have to make the trek all the way across campus. Shaw Hall is located on Euclid Avenue and all computer engineering and computer science features that students need are accessible 24-7. For the first time ever, the National Panhellenic Council is teaming up with University Union for a day surrounding social justice. Cues for Good is an all-day event happening this weekend in the Shine Student Center. It will consist of a panel featuring ABC's Gronish star Yara Shahidi and rapper Joey Badass, as well as a cultural food tasting and networking event, all followed by a concert. <laughs> President Andrew Fowler says an event like this is meant to bring students of all demographics into one space. All the proceeds from the event will be donated to three Syracuse City Schools. Tickets are still available at the Shine Box office. Today kicks off the 7th annual Syracuse University Blood Battle. That's right, Christine. For the past few years, Syracuse University has be been the reigning champs over Boston College. The battle begins in February but lasts until April. So far, 96 students have signed up to donate blood today, but the Syracuse Red Cross is hoping to get at least 200. The Red Cross says 20% of its donations come from students. And every time you donate, you save up to three lives. And if you're willing to donate, the Red Cross will be at the Goldstein Auditorium in the Shine Center until 7 o'clock tonight. We, we right now, um, blood is leaving the hospital shelves faster than it's coming in, so we have a critical level need. So it's a really, especially great time to partner, which is one of the reasons why Syracuse University and the Red Cross team up for this event. There are two ways that you can donate. Um, one, you can go through the website, and two, you can download the app, which you text blood app to 90999. Lightwork is a nonprofit organization that is run by Artists for Artists. Its main purpose is to grant aspiring and upcoming photographers the chance and the tools to live out their dreams. Our own Billy Owens joins us now to tell us how a new grant is creating new opportunities. Thanks guys, Like Work was recently awarded two grants that brought in some major funding for the program. Even though the grants together amount to $110,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts and Joy of Giving for Something, for many photographers you could not have put a price on the opportunity. To come here and spend a full month focus on my personal work and not have to worry about like financial constraints so much uh, is, is extremely beneficial. Guillaume Simenon, 
a member of the residency program offered through Lightwork, did not always think he would be a photographer. Uh, my girlfriend at the time was in uh, was getting into uh, the art program, so I started crashing her classes uh, of photography and and talking to her teachers, and and they saw that I was way more into photography than I was into biology and applied science. So they pointed me in the right direction and I moved to Montreal and, and that's where I got really involved with photography and I never looked back. Photographers will also have a chance to be featured in the Kathleen O. Ellis Gallery. Shane Lavalette, who has worked his way up from being a light work resident to art director, knows how much these grants can help an artist. So there are artists from all over the place that have a need for time, space, and money to support making their work. So, you know, getting grants from the NEA and, and recently from JGS to support our programs, but specifically the residency program is a really uh, a wonderful thing. Photographers get to use a top-of-the-art lab facility offered through Lightwork to better their craft. Students, staff, or even faculty can use the lab to make work, learn how to print and scan pictures, and use the in-house studio and traditional black and white lab. Lightwork is always looking to help new artists. If you're interested in checking out some photos, you can stop by the studio on Waverly Avenue here on campus. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Billy Owens. Back to you, Christine and Mai. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, a university committee has created a new way to help students who are recipients of DACA or are undocumented. NCC News reporter Odea Pinkus sits down with Huey Sow from the Office of Multi Multicultural Affairs to talk about the new effort. Have you ever gone to the store thinking what you need to buy would cost a certain amount, but it comes out? Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. I'm Odea Pincus. Yesterday, a second U.S. District Judge blocked President Trump's plan to get rid of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, or DACA. It's the program that protects children from deportation if they were brought to the U.S. illegally by their parents. Now, we're joined this morning by the Associate Director for Multicultural Affairs here at SU, Huey Shao, and he's going to talk about a new resource available to students who are either undocumented or are recipients of DACA. So, uh, Mr. Shao, you're part of a committee here called the Ad Hoc Committee uh, for DACA slash undocumented students. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, thank you. So this is a committee that was convened last year um, where we kind of looked at um, institutional policies and things like that to develop a, a series of recommendations for the chancellor. Um, and it was reconvened uh, over the fall uh, where the recommendations were accepted and now we're in the process of implementing uh, the recommendations. Okay, so one of these recommendations was this new web page of resources. So uh, kind of explain what's going on with that. What can people find on this site? Yeah, so that, that resource is basically helping undocumented students and DACA students as well as students from mixed status families, which means students who, who are documented but may have family members that are undocumented. Um, and so basically this resource helps students um, better navigate the campus uh, from the whole student experience. So from coming to campus, admissions, financial aid, to being on campus, from like resources like the counseling center, um, the cultural centers, ethnic studies departments, um, what have you, student organizations, um, just to kind of give them better footing um, and better support at SU. So what are some of these issues that maybe students who are either recipients of DACA or are undocumented might have that maybe other students might not even know about? I mean, I think the biggest thing, although people probably do know about this with the March 5th deadline looming, um, but, but I'll say it anyway. I mean, I think like the uncertainty of DACA and immigration policy, I think the biggest thing is probably the anxiety um, that's going on. But I'll say at the same time that um, these students I think there's no cookie cutter experience and what I would recommend people to do is to just listen to stories, um, to, to hear what, what students have to say. All right, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Shao. And that webpage can be found on uh, the SYR website. I'm Odea Pincus, back to you guys at the news desk.
My, you know, once the clock strikes midnight, that Valentine's Day candy goes on sale, right? Oh, yes, I know. But for extreme couponers in Syracuse, say to listen to their tips and you could possibly get it cheaper than the sale price. Whether it's holiday candy, toilet paper, or ramen noodles, most college students shop on a budget. Edgar James is the founder of Syracuse Extreme Couponers. James says it's important for students to read store ads, pick up the newspaper, and look at online coupon websites. He says it's best for students who are interested in extreme couponing to start small. For example, he says to download the store's app, Wegmans, Target, Dollar General, to name a few, have an app. He says the app will have coupons directly from that store. But if you also look for manufacturer coupons from online or the newspaper, you could get double the savings at stores. It's just like you're going to school. If you put in the time, you're going to get that degree. If you put in the time for couponing, you're going to get that payoff. You can find his live videos and businesses on Facebook at Syracuse Extreme Couponers. Good morning, I'm Jose Cuevas with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. The Syracuse, the Syracuse Orange had an opportunity to avenge their loss earlier in the season to Wake Forest this past Sunday. Not only would that W mean revenge, but it would surely help the chances of getting into the NCAA tournament. The game would prove to be a barn burner. There you see Frank Howard, who would go on to have a pivotal role for the Orange and score 12 points in the game. And on to the tip off. Top of the first, and Tyus Battle tells Bryant Crawford, sit down as he breaks his ankle, steps back, shoots a three, and sinks it in. Syracuse up 7-2. With a little under five to play in the first, Howard with a bounce pass to Brissett, who emphatically slams it down. Syracuse up 24-16. Time winding down in the first, Crawford from a 40 feet out, sinks a buzzer beater, 31-21. Cues up by 10, going into the half. Back in the second half with 14 left to play. Battle launches a three and one as he's fouled. Cues 43, Wake Forest 32. Close game down to the wire as Woods lobs it up and Moore slams it down. Wake now within three. Crawford trying to keep Wake in it as Chukwu tells him, nope, not in my house. Battle sprints to get the loose ball and slam dunk City to seal the deal. Syracuse avenges their loss against Wake Forest. Syracuse 78, Wake Forest 70. The Orange women would also face off against Wake Forest. However, they would find themselves in an upward climb the majority of the game. Would they be able to bounce back and secure the W in a game littered with turnovers? Let's find out. With a little under six minutes to play in the first, Tiana Mangakakia trying to shake off some defenders, hits a nice spin move, steps back and sinks a bucket. Cues up nine to five in the second, Mangakia carving up the defense, beating up four defenders, and lobbing a phenomenal layup to keep Cuse in it. Cuse down 34 to 17, and a turnover. These are proved to be pivotal as the, for the Orange, as Gabrielle Cooper takes on the last defender and adds another bucket for the Cuse comeback. Cuse driving forward, pushing the pace, as Gabrielle Cooper launches a three-pointer. Cuse with an 11 late in the second quarter. On to the third, Wake Forest takes a risky pass as Nawaje intercepts, drives forward, and takes a classy layup to score two out of her eight points in the game. Another turnover as Cooper lays it in. Cuse 44, Wake Forest 41 in the fourth. Cuse would establish a lead. That didn't stop Mangakia from stealing the ball and adding to her tally of 26 points overall. Cuse wins 71 to 61. The SU men play tonight against NC State at 9 p.m. here at the Carrier Dome, while the women's team face off tomorrow against Duke. That's your sports update. I'm Jose Cuevas, and go Orange! Thanks for sticking with us. Now a little fun fact about Central New York. The village of Baldwinsville houses one of 12 Einenhauser Bush breweries in America and has for 40 years or so. Beer is definitely tapped here in CNY. Craft breweries are popping up all over the area to Jaeger lovers delight. Morning on the Hills, Nicole Dimitri is headed to the fairgrounds for a local taste tailored to beer lovers. At the 22nd annual CNY Brew Fest, there was music, pretzels, and lots and lots of beer. A lot more uh, brewers, owners, beers that you can't get anywhere else. And we've got to deal with Lyft. Uh, Barclay Damon, so it's $10 off your ride to and from. Around 2,400 tickets at $50 each were sold for the event at the state fairgrounds. Now normally the Brewfest is the day prior to the Super Bowl, 
but not this year. There's another big brew fest in Boston, Super Bowl weekend, uh, and there was a home SU game on that Saturday, so that's two things we don't want to compete with. And here at LIC Beer, there's 126 to try, and it's really simple. All you do is get a cup and pour. Enjoy. A record-breaking number of breweries from around the country came to share their glass with Central New Yorkers. There you go. Oh, cheers. Hill Farmstead made its local debut after being named the best brewery in the world, according to Rape Beer. I'm from Rochester, uh, but we're pouring here with Hill Farmstead, uh, which is from northern Vermont. Lager lovers also came from all over, including Mary and Noor Trahan from the home of Samuel Adams. We spent about 45 minutes making a bunch of necklaces to um, imbibe in so you could eat and drink safely. Determined, the sister-in-laws made sure to try as many fresh brews as possible. As for Brewfest director Purdy, this was his second year in charge, and he plans on tapping many more kegs. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Nicole Dementry. I'm Allison Caliguire, and here's what's going on this weekend here on the Hill. Tomorrow, the Syracuse women's basketball team takes on Duke at 7 p.m. in the Carrier Dome. And don't miss the much-anticipated premiere of Black Panther at the Destiny USA Mall. The Auburn YMCA is inviting you to try scuba diving for free from 7.30 to 9 on Friday night. All you need to bring is a swimsuit and a towel. Also on Friday, the premiere of Mohawk is happening at the Palace Theater at 7. The film, the film was right here in Central New York. On Saturday, stop by Orange Ability at, in the Women's Building. On Saturday, and the Women's Building for sports like wheelchair basketball and sled hockey. Also on Saturday, the Syracuse men's lacrosse team plays the University of Albany at 2 in the Carrier Dome. On Sunday, make sure you take advantage of the nice weather with Empire Brewery offering snowshoeing on their farmland with 12 miles of trails. That starts at 11.30. And that's Weekends on the Hill. I'm Allison Caliguire. Some furry friends at the Roseman River Zoo in Syracuse were given their Valentine's Day treats a little early. Love certainly was in the air Sunday afternoon when just about every animal received their own personalized Valentine snack made by volunteers and keepers. The goats weren't too interested in their treats as much as they were craisins. And love sucked for the zoo's raven and crow. As for Basil, the red panda, he wasn't exactly into the I love you message at first. Yep, he will slowly but surely. He's going to check out and see if I'll give him any freebies probably first. <laughs> and then, then go down. With whispers of how cute he was, Basil eventually indulged in his valentine. That is going to do it for us this Wednesday here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Christine Morton. Follow us on social media. And I'm Maya Owens. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday live at 10 a.m. right here on OTN. Wow. Uh, kind of jealous of the end.